need a miracle. And I, I wanted to show this clip, one, because it's really funny. Um, and it ends with them finally getting what they need and they feed Wesley, the guy on the table, a, chocolate, a pill with chocolate coating so it makes it go down easier. And finally, Miracle Max and his wife are waving goodbye and the wife turns and says, do you think it'll work? And he says, it'll take a miracle. Um, wouldn't it be awesome if there were a place we could go where we could have a transaction, we could pay some money, and someone would work a miracle for us? Wouldn't that be awesome? I know that I would like that. I know that I would love to hand over some cash, follow some rules, and experience or be the beneficiary of a miracle. I think that would be awesome. I wish there was a Miracle Max on every corner like a CVS or a Walgreens or something. Um, unfortunately, that is not the case, right? It, miracles, I don't know for, for you, but for me, I don't know if I've ever seen or experienced a, mir a miracle firsthand. Now, when I say miracle, I'm, I'm trying to, I want to be very specific. I'm talking about something that kind of goes beyond what is normal, what is possible in our space, our time with these bodies, like something that goes beyond that, that clearly must be from a divine source, from God specifically. That's the kind of miracle I'm talking about. Now, I have a two-year-old and, you know, having my son be born and raising him and not murdering him is probably a miracle. Um, I like to say that the first year was keeping him alive and then from then on it's not killing him uh, because of the way he behaves. But childbirth, having a kid is miraculous for sure, but it's commonplace. I'm talking, the miracles I'm talking about are the things that are not commonplace, that are rare. When you read in the scriptures about healings, when you read about somebody being raised from the dead, when you read about St. Peter, right, this guy, this disciple of Jesus, walking on water. That's the kind of miracle I'm talking about. I've never seen, at least that I know of, maybe I've seen it and I attributed it to something else, I've never seen that happen. You know, I like to rationalize stuff. I like to go, you know what, maybe, maybe it didn't really happen like that. Maybe when Peter stepped out of the boat, he had really wide feet. So it took him a while to sink, and that's why they thought he walked on. Or he was just a really beautiful swimmer. His butterfly stroke was incredible, and the guys were like, he was so, such a good swimmer, he practically walked on water. I don't know. But I don't know if I've ever seen a miracle. I want to see them. Not, I don't even need to experience it. Like, I don't want to necessarily be the person to receive. Like, I have friends. I have a friend who's in a wheelchair. She's bound to a wheelchair. I would love to see her walk again. I would love to see people who are terminally ill be healed. I would love to see God move in incredible, incredible ways. Um, and for you, maybe you've witnessed a miracle before. Maybe you've seen something like that happen. And you know what? I'm, if, you, if that's the case, and I'm, I'm so glad that you were here, I think you have a part to play in our faith. We need to hear those stories. We need you to share what's gone on, what you've seen, what you've experienced, what you know, because it'll build our faith. It'll help us put our trust and our belief in God. But if you're here and you're like me, you, you consider yourself to be a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus, but you're like, I'm not so sure about these miracles. Yeah, I believe in God. I trust Jesus with my life, but really, like every little story in the, in the scripture, like those crazy things happened, I'm not so sure. If that's you, good. I'm, I'm kind of with you in that. I hope that today, the, this message will encourage you to trust, to look beyond what is possible, to expect God to do great things. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're not sure what you believe, or you're like, you know what, I know I don't believe, I'm glad that you are here as well, because I think that in reality, these miracle stories in the Bible, they're not just about the people who experience the miracles. They're not just about the miracles themselves, the healings, the raising of the dead, walking the water. They point to something much, much bigger. So if you follow with me and we'll go in this together, I think that we'll all learn some good stuff. So what I want to do is I want to look at a story that is found in the New Testament. Uh, this story is found, there's four Gospels, the four accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This story is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it's a story about a woman with a hemorrhage or some issue of blood. Um, but let me give you some backstory to this passage so we kind of set it up. So uh, the people of God, known as the Israelites, right, the Jewish nation, they for a while were the top 
nation in the world, in civilization. Um, and unfortunately, after the reign of King David and King Solomon, things kind of fell apart. There was division. Uh, the kingdom split into two, and eventually they were conquered, and then they were exiled. The temple where they worshipped Yahweh, God, was destroyed, and they were without a home. Um, and then fast forward, and then you get the Roman Empire, and they are the pinnacle of society. They are the government. They are everything. And the Jewish people are longing, are waiting and waiting and hoping and praying for some kind of deliverance. They're expecting God to give them a savior, a Messiah, which means the anointed one. They're expecting this person to show up and to overthrow the government and to restore Israel back to being the superpower it once was in the world. But that's not how it happens. Instead, they get a carpenter. And when he has his triumphal entry into Israel, he doesn't ride a war horse followed by an army. He rides a donkey. And he's humble. And he teaches. But he doesn't overthrow the physical government. He overthrows the spiritual government. His is not a kingdom of earthly might. It is a kingdom of heavenly power. And he overthrows the powers that are beyond what is physical. And so he comes in, and people don't know what to make of this guy, Jesus. Some people love him. The religious leaders of the day hate him because he's kind of robbing them of their influence and power uh, in society. And they want to murder him. Um, and the people, they're like, okay, who is this guy? We've heard the things he said. They're incredible. I want to hear more. I've seen the things he's done. I'm going to follow this guy. And crowds, wherever, just about wherever he goes, crowds follow him. For him to get any kind of peace and quiet, he has to escape and get, to him, get by himself and pray. So where we pick up is Jesus is around 30 years old. He's in the time of his ministry. He is supposed to go to the house of a guy named Jairus uh, because Jairus told Jesus, my daughter is dying. I really need you to come to my house and take care of this. So Jesus is, and Jairus are on their way to Jairus' house, and we pick up there. Now, the, the, the verses that you're going to see are gonna be a combination of the Gospel of Luke, the story of that, of this woman that we're going to read about, and from Mark and they're kind of mixed matched and put together because I think it tells a full earth story. It says this, As Jesus was on his way, the crowds pressed around him. Very simply, it was like Times Square on New Year's Eve. Maybe not with millions of people, but it was so packed. It was like sardines in a can. It was like Black Friday at Walmart. All right? There was just a ton of people, and they desperately wanted to get near Jesus, and there's lots and lots of people around him, and they're pressing around him, and he's surrounded. He's totally surrounded. And it says this, now a woman was there who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of many doctors, and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. So this woman is suffering from a hemorrhage. Um, the King James Version of the Bible, I believe, uses the phrase, she has an issue of blood. Simply, or rather, what experts think it was, was probably some kind of menstrual bleeding that would not stop. And she suffered for 12 years and spent a great deal of money trying to get better, and nothing happened. So physically, she's constantly under this condition. Financially, she's spent a ton trying to get better, and nothing seems to be working. Mentally and emotionally, I imagine this taking a huge toll on her, that she's having to deal with this all the time. She's concerned about ruining clothing, which clothing was very expensive back then. It was not easy to get clothing. We didn't, they didn't have the technology that we have today. Um, in terms of culture and religion, if she was a Jewish woman in a Jewish culture, uh, the law, the Jewish law states that if, you, if you're a woman and you are bleeding, you must be kind of separated from everyone else. If a woman who was bleeding sat down on any surface, nobody could sit on that surface because that surface was ceremonial, un ceremonially unclean, was unfit to be used. Furthermore, when a woman's period ended, she had to go through a cleansing process of seven days, wait seven days, and then go through a purification ritual to then be okay. So if you do the math, that's about two weeks out of every month a woman is supposed to be kind of like off limits. So you can imagine what this woman was going through. She's alone for 12 years. She's not supposed to be touched. No one's supposed to get 
intimately close to her or be with her at all. Additionally, in terms of society, she's probably an outcast because she can't touch anything. She's not allowed to sit down. You wouldn't want to invite her over for dinner because if she sat down, that chair would then become off limits. So you can imagine the turmoil and the emotional um, you know, difficulty she's experiencing. Now, spiritually, take this a step further. If you're ceremonial unclean, you cannot enter the synagogue. You aren't supposed to enter the temple. So as a Jewish woman, if you're supposed to be worshiping God and regularly visit the temple and perform these ceremonies to honor God, you can't even perform because you're not allowed in the building. So now the God that has created her, that has required her to worship her, hasn't healed her. So now she's not even allowed to go into the place to worship so it's like these, she split. She's like, okay, I want to worship God. I want to honor him, but i am got this condition. On the other hand, it's like, what is my life even about if I can't do anything? So she is utterly alone and desperate for help. And the story continues. It says, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she kept saying, if only I touch his clothes, I will be healed. At once, the bleeding stopped, and she felt it in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, this is amazing, because Jesus, who was brought up in a Jewish family, he understood the rules. He understood the Jewish law. He didn't always follow the rules. He often broke them, but he understood the law. And this woman risked making Jesus unclean by touching him. She was bold enough and desperate enough to go, you know what, I've got to do something. And she heard, I don't, we don't know from whom, she heard that Jesus was near and that he was capable, that he was different. He was more than what this world was like. So she went and she touched him. But despite all of the rules, despite making things unclean because she was unclean, she touches someone named Jesus who is so clean so pure, so holy, so much more than he doesn't become unclean, she becomes clean and she's healed. So my first, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> By touching him, she's restored. So my first point for today is that Jesus is greater. All right, he is greater. He is greater than your circumstances. He is greater than your sin. He is greater than human weakness, frailty, illness, than the confines of our thoughts. He is greater than the labels and the descriptors we put on him. He transcends what is possible. He transcends what is normal. So to touch him doesn't dirty him. It makes us clean. And she was bold enough to go and do that. And she touched him uh, because she knew that something was different about Jesus. Jesus is greater. And the story continues. It says that Jesus knew at once that power had gone out from him, which is kind of a cool an odd statement that Jesus knew some kind of something left him and went to her and healed her. So he turns around in the crowd and says, who touched my clothes? Now, going back, imagine it's Times Square, New Year's Eve, and someone touches you. You're going to be like, everyone's touching me. This is gross. Um, who touched my clothes? And the disciples turn to him and say, you see the crowd pressing against you. And you say, who touched me? Like, they're sarcastic. Like, really? Who touched you? I don't know. Everyone here? He says, no, no, no. Listen, someone touched me, for I know that power has gone out from me. So he's looking around. He's trying to find this person that touched him. Continuing, but he looked around to see who had done it. And when the woman saw that she could not escape uh, notice, with fear and trembling, she came and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. Now, in the presence of all the people, she explained why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. So think about this. All these people are clamoring to get to Jesus. He says, who touches me? And it turns out to be the woman that people know about, the woman with the issue of blood. For 12 years, this woman has been untouchable, and she touches Jesus. And before everyone, she's afraid, she's trembling, she is scared for her life, and she confesses everything before everyone. 
But what's amazing is that it's not that she just touched him, it's that she touched him and she was healed. She's no longer who she used to be. She's made whole. She is restored, and Jesus took care of her. And now she has the opportunity to tell everyone there that I am no longer this woman who is unclean. I am no longer this person that is untouchable. I have been redeemed. I am made new. I am healed because of who Jesus is. She's telling everyone about who he is and what his power is like, what he can do. So my second point for today is to show and tell. It wasn't enough for Jesus just to heal her and be like, okay, look, that's it. Now, there's times when he says, don't tell anybody, which seemed odd in some of the other passages where somebody's healed. He, wanted to, he didn't want people to get the wrong idea. They, he didn't want people to just come to him just for healing. But she can tell them, no, this guy is the real deal. If God has touched your life, if God has changed your life, you have a role to play in this grand story. You have a part to play. You must go out and share it with others. Show and tell. If you've seen miracles, if God has changed your life, if you, if, if you knew you were once lost but now you're found, if you were enslaved to sin and now you are set free, show and tell other people. That is what you are called to do. But here's the thing. The miracles themselves, this, this healing that she experienced was not the point. Yes, she would benefit from it. Yes, it changed her life. But think about all the people that now know about who Jesus was, right? The doctors who she had seen for years that couldn't do anything now know that there's this God who is here, who is able, who is capable, who is powerful. Think about all the friends and family who couldn't visit her. Not only could they now see her and hang out with her and spend time with her, but more importantly, they're like, okay, this guy Jesus is it. Or this entire crowd that had surrounded Jesus, they, they were there maybe for selfish reasons, for religious reasons, whatever it might be, but now they know that Jesus is more than just a man. So go show and tell because what you can do with your story is build the faith of others. Your story can empower others to trust and place their belief in who God is. So she tells Jesus, confesses to him, here's everything that's gone on. I've been sick. I, I was desperate. I had no money left. I needed God to intervene. So I just came here and I touched you. And she confesses it all to him before everyone. And then Jesus responds to her. And this is how this story of this woman ends. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. That phrase is beautiful, but really bothersome to me. I really have a hard time with this verse. The fact that she got healed, great. He says, go in peace, like, like, go live your life, go enjoy the rest of the time you have on this planet. You are healed of this disease, great. It's the phrase, your faith that bothers me. And here's why. And, and maybe you, you'll feel the same way. When I think about miracles, I like to believe that God is just doing God's thing. And He's just in charge. He's sovereign. He's ruling over the universe and my life, our lives, whether we like it or not. And He just does what God does. But this verse says that she had a part to play in the miracle. That somehow her faith was part of, I, I don't want to use the word because I don't think it's this formulaic, but, but part of the equation. That somehow her faith was required for this event to happen. And that bothers me because I know people who I believe have great faith in God who pray, who pray and pray and pray and seek God for healing, for miracles, for God to intervene in others' lives, in their own lives, and nothing seems to happen. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Like, you, you, we, we expect God to move because we're called to pray, we're called to seek Him, and then nothing happens, and we're like, God, what now? Like, what do I do with this? It's heavy. I'm watching somebody's life deteriorate because they're, in, they're, they're sick. They're going to die because of this thing. Can you step in and do something, and nothing seems to happen. So what is it? 
Is it the faith? Do I not have enough faith? Does the person I'm praying for not have any faith? Like, is there a threshold they've got to reach? Is there a certain amount of faith I need to have? What do I need to do? Do I need to exercise my faith and get to a point where now it's finally strong enough and it's the tipping point and now we can see something happen? Where is that line? So I, I don't like this verse. It, it bothers me because then I go, well, I'm, I've got my doubts. Does that mean that my faith is kind of weak and, and, and not going to make I don't know, God cooperate? I don't know. I was reading about this verse um, in a, a Bible commentary. Um, and what, this, what, what Jesus is saying here is that it wasn't touching the robe. That would have been like wizardry. It would have been magic. It would have been like visiting Miracle Max. <laughs> All right, touching his robe, like follow these rules and psh, you'll get what you want. No, what Jesus is trying to say here is, look, the word faith in in the original language can also mean belief and trust. It was not that her faith, it was like, had hit a certain amount, hit a threshold. It was that she believed that Jesus was God. And that's the tipping point. It's like an all or nothing. There's no in-between. It's not like a certain amount. It's like, no, if God is here in the man of Jesus, that's it. That is the faith Jesus is talking about. It's like, you believe that I'm the Son of God? You believe that I am who I say I am? That's your faith. That has made you well. And this is huge because the miracles of these stories, and there's other stories throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament of the Bible, the miracles are not the point. The miracles are supposed to be signs. When you, in the original language, in the Greek, in this passage, when, uh, and not in this passage, excuse me, in other passages where it talks about miracles, the word is signs. And as we know, signs contain information or they tell us which way to go. Signs give us some kind of indication of what's going on. The miracles are not the point. The miracles are point to God. So her faith was not about the healing. Her faith was not even about her issue. Her faith was God is here in the presence of everyone else through Jesus. So, some time goes on from this story. As far as we know, they never interact again. This woman is healed. Everything seems to be good. Um, You may have heard of the story where Jesus feeds like 5,000 people, which some people estimate to be actually 10,000 because it was 5,000 men and some women probably and children. So like 10,000 people are fed through some miraculous event where there was almost no food. Some time goes on past that and now people are hearing, like really hearing about Jesus and like, okay, we got to follow this guy. This guy's giving out free food, all right? (laughs) Free food is good. It's really good. Uh, If you had a bagel, you know. Um... (laughs) always said, food is great, but free food is even better. Um, so Jesus sees this crowd, sees these crowds, and he's like, look, you're not here for the right reasons. This is, comes from the, uh, the fourth gospel, uh, John chapter 6. He says, Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, the word signs, I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Basically saying, look, why are you really after me? What is it that you really want? Are you just trying to fulfill your desires? Are you just trying to use me for your benefit? Are you just trying to get out of me what you want rather than being concerned about what God ultimately wants? Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, which was a nickname for Jesus, um, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, he's, Jesus is talking about himself, for on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And the people respond, okay, uh, that sounds good. We won't work for food. What then do you want us to work towards? And Jesus answered, this is John chapter 6, verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Do we have that verse? There we are. This is the deed or work God requires, to believe in the one whom he sent. So that is our last point 
for today, to believe in the one God has sent. I, I would love to see miracles happen, and I have a friend, I have one friend, <laughs> I'm working on it, okay, I have one friend, and his name is Domingo, and uh, he, he's really good, he's a good friend to have, he makes up for like 30 people. Um, that was not what I wanted to say. I have a friend who is a missionary, and he tells me these stories, and I believe this guy. He's been a missionary to uh, Tanzania for years. Um, what was really cool is that he would bring his family with him. It wasn't just him, right? He, he's married, he has four kids. They lived as a family in Tanzania and would go village to village, speaking the languages of these villagers to tell them about who Jesus was. And they have seen miracles. He's seen his young daughter pray for a blind woman. And then she's like, I can see your face. Yeah. And it's like, whoa. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay. Not only good because she's healed, but like, okay, God is still alive and active. But again, her healing is not the point. It's a sign. It points to God. So, for me, and for you, and for everyone, it's not about the miracles themselves. And if you struggle with believing that part, I think we're okay. Okay? But, if it's pointing to something greater, it's pointing to Jesus. What do you believe about Him? Jesus said, the work of God is this, this is going back to the last verse, to believe in the one he has sent. The work of God, the deed, what you and I are required to do are, is to believe, to investigate this. That doesn't mean just go in blindly and be like, okay, I believe, great. No. Is Jesus who he said he is? Is he actually the son of God? Is he your Lord? Is he your savior? Was he just a man, or did he die, and did he rise from the dead? That is what we have to wrestle with. That is what we have to embrace. That is the work of God, to believe in the one that God has sent. So, going back to this woman's story. She spent all that money, 12 years had passed, but then she hears about who Jesus is. And she cannot be still. She's like, okay, I've got to put my faith in action. She hears these stories. Jesus is doing incredible things. He's saying things like the kingdom of God is near. God is not dead. He is not absent. He is active and present. She's like, I'm going to find this man. I'm going to see if he is the real deal. And she risks her well-being and touches him. And she, her life is changed. And then she tells everybody about who God is. So I want you to leave this place today wrestling with the idea that Jesus actually is the one who God has sent, that he is the son of God. Because that, that is where our faith begins, right? Your faith has made you well. Faith in that idea that God sent his son Jesus to be in this world, to die on our behalf and to rise from the dead, that we might now be brought into the family of God, that's it. That is the grand miracle of the Bible, that you and I are no longer estranged from God. We belong to his family. So, please, when you leave here, the rest of this week and beyond, rest with this idea, who is Jesus? Is he indeed the one that God has sent? Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, I thank you for, uh, for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these guys who decided to record and write down these stories about Jesus, um, that they were willing to not let these things just go by and have us rely on oral tradition, but we have them, a written account, several accounts of who he is. God, I pray for those here who are uh, Christians, who are strong in their faith, who, have, who believe in miracles, who have seen them and witnessed them. God, I pray that you would empower them to share these stories with others, that they might build faith in you, um, but faith in in others as well, God. We pray, God, that if we're here and we're wrestling with this stuff and it still seems hard to grasp, like how is the 
impossible possible. God, I pray that you would give us courage to trust in you, to expect you still to do great things in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. And for those of us who are here and aren't sure what we believe, God, I pray that we would wrestle with this idea that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, that Jesus was sent here by you for a grand purpose to redeem us, to restore us to your kingdom. God, I pray for all of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you.